Hello everyone, in this, this video is about sampling in research. Uh, before moving into sampling, I would like to show you how sampling is actually related to our everyday practices. So, if I blindfold you and ask you to guess a dish or a meal in front of you, how would you do it? So, if just say that I have uh, given you a uh, chicken curry and I blindfold you, how do you know it is a chicken curry? usually you have to do the tasting so when you taste how do you actually decide it's a chicken curry because of the flavor that is comes out from the um, the dish how do you get the flavor the flavor is actually coming from the herbs and the spices and that herbs and spices that makes the chicken curry unique so um, in order to determine the taste and identity of a product you need to have a proper selection of spices the right amount of the spices and the proper procedure in preparing the spices so when all these three steps has been followed you get a proper taste the right taste for the particular dish so in this example when I given you when I give you a chicken curry and I ask you to taste blindfolded and you're able to say it is a chicken curry based on the taste and the flavor that you get from the curry that is resulted from the spices that has been used so when a selection amount of the preparation of the spices differ the taste will differ and the end product will also differ so if if you um, if you want to do a fried chicken it will definitely be a different set of spices different procedures and different amount compared to cooking a chicken curry so this is trying to highlight how spices actually determines a dish and also the, it is the key for the taste of a dish. So it is very crucial on the spices that we use on the amount and also the procedure of using the spices. So how is this related to our research? In our research, the spice in the research is actually our sample the participants because they provide you with the crucial information for your study and basically they are flavoring your studies they are bringing the taste and the um, the aroma and everything to your study so in order to obtain the proper flavor to their study or the crucial information for your study you need to select your um, participants correctly with the right uh, number of people or number of participants in the proper procedure in selecting them to get the right information for your study so this process of, of preparing spices in research is called sampling so what is sampling it is a process of collecting or creating a sample from your population so you are subsetting um, from your population so it's important to have a proper selection procedure and also so why sampling is important in cooking every dish has its own spice list amount and preparation steps so failure to follow the list the amount or the preparation will result into different tastes and not the real representation of the dish so what happens when people eat the dish so they say that oh the dish that you are providing might be misinterpreted because of the flavor so it might get rejected by the by people or somebody who's tasting your dish in research every researcher requires to have his own customized sample so failure to obtain the correct sample the appropriate size and the procedure will provide irrelevant information same like your spices if you include the wrong spices you will not get the right so same in research if you do not include the right sample you will never get a correct information and as a result your interpretation of the results can be biased so there is a tendency of misreporting your results or information so what is actually the sampling process that one has to follow in research firstly when you're doing a sampling or selecting your samples you need to identify your population so from the population you identify a sampling frame 
Sampling frame is actually the accessible section of your target population. It's the, usually the list of people that you have access to. And from the list that you get or from the sampling frame, you need to identify your sample. And in order to identify your sample, there are multiple techniques to get to the sample. Okay, and that is what we are going to look into the next slides. So sampling techniques, or we can uh, consider there are two uh, different ways of collecting samples. Okay, once you have your popul defined population, you have your uh, list of accessible participants. Now you need to identify how you're going to get the sample. So there are two uh, main techniques. We call it probability sampling and non-probability sampling. Probability sampling actually trying to say that every participant in your sampling phrase has equal opportunity to be in the study. And among the type of probability sampling are simple random sampling, stratified sampling and multi-stage sampling. There are more probability sampling but these are among the most commonly used. So what is probab non-probability sampling then? It is the opposite of probability sampling. So in non-probability sampling, you always, not everybody has the equal chance. Maybe the participants might, uh, uh, some participants had favorable, um, might be favorable to, to include it in the study. Maybe they were voluntarily participating. So basically, if he, not everybody will have the chance to participate. So among the type of non-probability sampling that is widely used are convenience sampling, voluntary response sampling, and also snowball sampling. Just like probability sampling, there are other types of non-probability sampling as well. And these are just three main, uh, mostly used or applied uh, techniques. So how do you run a simple random sampling? Firstly, you need to get a sampling frame. So which consists of participants in the entire sampling frame. And then you assign numbers to each of the participants in the list. And then the third step is you select the names randomly. So there are two ways of doing the random uh, selection. Firstly is you write all the names and put them in a bowl or in a, in a box and you randomly pick the number or the name from the um, a pool of names or pool of um, from the hat or from the bowl okay so you pick one on, and followed by the second until you reach your sample size requirement or the other way around is you can use the table random numbers or you can use the uh, random number generator to identify the numbers um, of your sample so and then from there you actually identify who is the participant okay so for example uh, a sampling frame could be all students of faculty of human development because you have access to them you can get the list of the students so the second step is you assign the numbers to each of them or id and you can randomly select from the list or the ids that has been assigned to, to that so in stratified random sampling firstly is first step is you get the sampling frame list of participants in the sampling frame and then you break them into strata or group of interest if you notice um, in this example we are using we are using the same example students of faculty of human development and in that in the faculty we have different programs so we are actually breaking the group of students into uh, breaking them in breaking the students by their program so there are three main stratas or three main groups we have the first group is psychology and counseling students strata 2 is special education and strata 3 is early childhood so we are dividing the list by program and and then we assign numbers to them the third stage is we identify the proportion of the groups so based on the list i realized that the first strata consists of 40 percent of this entire sample this entire uh, sampling frame uh, 35 percent of the students comes from strata 2 and 25 percent comes from the strata 3 so if i want to have 120 samples then i need to calculate the number of respondent needed from each strata so i calculate for strata 1 40 percent out of 120 i need 48 students from that strata 42 from the second strata and 30 from the 
third strata. So based on that, I am getting the uh, proportion of these different groups of people. And then once I know that I need to have 48, 42 and 30 students, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, select the names randomly from each of the strata. So I, again, the random selection can be drawing out the names from a box or from a hat or you can also do a use the table random numbers. So basically at step 4, we're actually repeating the single random sampling. Okay. And uh, this time we're talking about convenient sampling is a type of non-probability sampling. So what we're doing here is firstly is you get the sampling frame. In this case, the potential participants for your study. We are using the same example, all students of Faculty of Human Development. So instead of getting the list, what you do is you approach people to participate in the study. So you stand right in front of a um, Faculty of Human Development office and then you invite participants to uh, be your um, participate in your study. So you are actually approaching them and getting um, participants for your study. So you repeat until you fulfill the sample size requirement and of the day you manage to get the required sample size. But again, not everybody in this faculty has equal chance. The people that uh, maybe that you are approaching are those who had problems to, I mean, coming to the office or somebody who are you know, part-time working at the, um, at the office. So these are the people that could be your participant. Other um, non-probability sampling techniques is called snowballing sampling. So in snowballing sampling, your first step is you find one or more participants that you have trust and uh, you have a good relationship with. So from there, the part, when you get the participant, one or more participant, and from that participant, you try to get them to suggest or recruit another participant. So basically, it is like um, you snowball. So from one person, you're trying to get the connection of the second person and then the third person. So in this example, if you notice, uh, this man has introduced two participants to to us, which is these two ladies. And one of the first lady has introduced another man. So it is actually growing. So it is just like, um, um, you know, it's like uh, you're getting recruitment or suggestions of participants from the participant itself. So you, if I being recruited into a study, then I find people who has the similar issues or maybe in the similar um, experiences to participate and then my uh, the person that I have recruited might recruit another participant so it's kind of like a chain of balls okay and when do we actually use snowball sampling when you're doing topics that are pretty sensitive and difficult to get samples so for example research on polygamy marriages I, this is a topic that is a bit sensitive and not many people are willing to talk about it. So maybe you find a participant who is in the polygamy marriage and from there he might have, he might be in a support group or he might have a WhatsApp group of uh, people in polygamy marriages. So he might introduce another participant to you or recruit a participant for you. And then from there the chain builds. So in this study I'll have a total of for a sample size of four so that's all for sampling techniques thank you